So with the with the pressure volume loops, as I said, we're going to deal with more of that in um, um, vavilopathies. We're going to begin by looking at the um, the Venus curves, and this is how it goes. By the time we're done, we'll mix everything, but we're going to dissect each one so that you know how to handle it and not get confused. As far as the uh, venous return curve or the vascular curve, the method by which you will be interpreting it. I'm going to be very methodical and detailed here, and then we're going to put everything together and then put clinical applications such as hemorrhage, such as congestive heart failure, exercise, and volume overload. All right, now with the vascular function curve, you're always going to move, instead of interpreting from left to right, as you do with most graphs, you're going to be interpreting this from right to left, kind of like what you would do, maybe perhaps with the pressure volume loop in a counterclockwise manner. Earlier as well, I was talking to you about the uh, length tension relationship. And in the length tension relationship, when you take a look at the active tension curve, the x-axis is length, and the y-axis <clears throat> is going to be pressure. Well, as you move on your active tension curve, which is the peak of your pressure volume loop, obviously you're going to interpret that from right to left, because when you contract, what will then happen to the length of the muscle, obviously it's going to decrease. So understand what you're doing. Don't just memorize the loop. Understand why it's moving counterclockwise. Same concept, and now we're going to do the vascular function curve. What's happening? Now, to understand the vascular function curve and the cardiac output curves, I need you to think of the heart and the systemic circulation as being a three-dimensional structure, obviously. The graph is trying to depict, depict <coughs> excuse me, a 3D type of mechanic, right? And that kind of becomes difficult, just like the ECG. We'll be dealing with that later on. All right, now... What you're specifically focusing upon is the fact that you're leaving, the blood is leaving from the left side of the heart, traveling through the entire systemic circulation, making it through the arterioles, the systemic capillaries, and then through the venules, and then the veins. I want you to f focus on the veins. Imagine that. The veins, the IVC and the SVC, is then returning the blood to the heart. Okay. I understand all that, Dr. Raj. You're not telling me anything that I don't know. I know. But where venous return is located on this graph is always going to be on the y-axis. Now, these graphs in cardiac and renal, we have a bunch of graphs to go through in renal as well. And so these parameters, especially on the y-axis, can be more than one thing. You just need to make sure which you, you coordinate the right parameter for the right curve. For example, well, Dr. Raja, not only do I see the venous return parameter on the y-axis. I also see the cardiac output parameter. Yeah, well, let's not focus on the cardiac output at this point, because we don't have a cardiac output curve on this graph, so let it go. Dissect everything and keep everything independent at this point. Next, I want you to notice that as we move up the y-axis, the venous return is increasing. Okay, I told you in order to interpret this graph effectively, you're going to move from right to left. You'll notice, I want you to first take a look at the normal control curve. And that right atrial pressure there we're going to label it as 7 millimeters mercury and then next, that point right there is then referred to commonly as your mean systemic pressure. A couple things that I need you to know. First, that right atrial pressure and that normal control curve is anchored on the x-axis at 7 millimeters mercury. Wow. Think about that for a second. The right atrium physiologically is normally about 0 to 2. So the fact that the right atrial pressure at that x-intercept 
is 7 millimeters mercury means that the right atrium is very full of blood, isn't it? Picture that. Now, this graph will begin theoretically, and then it will end physiologically. You'll see what I'm referring to. I dropped my mic, sorry. For the sake of better understanding, I am just going to put in the normal cardiac output curve. The reason I'm doing that is because you'll notice at 7 millimeters mercury, we're at zero. There's absolutely no activity of the cardiac output curve. So when, obviously, this is not practical. This is not physiology. This is theoretical, right? So when the heart is stopped, theoretically, you have a very full heart. And it is represented by the right atrial pressure at being 7. That you'll have to know. How do you interpret the vascular function curve? Right towards left. What does that even mean? Now, if the heart is full at 7 millimeters mercury, when the heart is stopped at 0, in order for blood to return back to the heart, the heart must pump its blood forward, correct? So therefore, what we're going to do is that we're going to meet up with the vascular function curve along with the cardiac output curve in which the amount of blood that's leaving the heart is then going to equal to the amount of blood that's returning to the heart and that is at steady state and at normal resting physiologic levels when the heart is contracting and ejecting its blood forward and blood is returning to that heart on average the right atrial pressure should be at two millimeters mercury so we will discuss how it's possible that for the vascular function curve it's moving from seven millimeters mercury and dropping 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 as you're interpreting from right to left until it reaches physiologically two millimeters mercury of right atrial pressure or zero that's all perfectly normal so zero to two so between zero to two of right atrial pressure the amount of blood that's returning to the heart now notice as you go from right to left and notice the gradient of that curve it's increasing as the gradient increases what is it represented by on the y-axis? The venous return. So as the gradient is increasing, the venous return is increasing back towards the heart as long as the heart is ejecting its blood forward. And as long as the proper cardiac output is taking place, then there will be proper venous return, which can increase. Now, as more of the cardiac output increases, now, for the cardiac output curve, you're going to interpret that from left to right. So we will be doing both at the same time, just a little bit, but mainly focusing upon the vascular function curve. So as the cardiac output curve is increasing and more of that blood is being ejected, the pressure within the heart is decreasing. Why? Because you're getting rid of the blood. So number one, cardiac output is increasing incrementally. Number two, as a result, the right atrial pressure is dropping from 7 towards 2. Number 3. As blood is leaving from the heart, physiologically, it has to be replaced. So number 3, venous return is increasing. And all those three things physiologically is occurring in you and I right now. You've understood that, then you've gotten the fundamentals of what you need to know in terms of anything that they'll throw at you with the mixed cardiac function curve. Now, we're going to play a li little bit more, obviously, and manipulate the cardiac output curve and the vascular function curve, and we'll be dealing with the vascular first. So just to recap, we're going to start at theoretical point base zero. No activity of the heart. Obviously, all theoretical. The heart, however, is very full. We know that. Because if you take a look at the mean systemic pressure of the x-intercept of the vascular function curve, it's a 7 millimeters mercury. That is not an empty heart. Next, as cardiac output is increasing, number one, 
the blood as it's being ejected, the pressure within the heart is decreasing. Number two, seven millimeters mercury is moving back down towards zero to two millimeters mercury, which is normal physiologic pressures within the right atrium. And number three, it is then being replaced by the blood that is being returned back to the heart through the IVC and SVC. Okay, now that we've understood that, that seven millimeters mercury called mean systemic pressure, know it as mean systemic pressure. If you find um, Yash, I think that you have access to that whenever, my friend. I don't know. Ask Jack. I don't think there's a limited time for that. But anyhow, um, Jack, would you mind looking at, into that real quick? Um, my point is this. At 7 millimeters mercury and the mean systemic pressure, any time that you find that the mean systemic pressure, the x-intercept, right there, is literally shifting to the right. Literally shifting to the right. Clinically speaking, does that mean increased or decreased volume within the heart? Does that in the heart, in the heart, not in the veins? Students make that mistake. Even doctors make that mistake all of the time. My point or my statement was when that mean systemic pressure, the x-intercept, is shifting over to the right, as you see here, towards 10, is there more or less blood in the heart, right? It means more volume within the heart, doesn't it? It means more volume within the heart. Okay, now. Wait, 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 what are you doing? I must have explained it in a way that you didn't understand. When the mean systemic pressure on the, the 7 millimeters mercury is moving to 10 millimeters mercury, the only way that you can have an increase in right atrial pressure is by having more blood in the heart, not less blood. So there is no way that this is hemorrhage. There is no way that this is any situation where there's less volume. In fact, it will be increase in volume. For example, IV overload. Secondly, secondly, I'm giving you the right atrium here. I'm giving you the IVC. We just keep it simple. Okay, one more time. When that seven millimeters mercury, this right here, let me remove, let me erase all this. We all agreed at seven millimeters mercury, that is a full heart. Theoretically, there is no movement of blood and the only way that you could have seven, mill seven millimeters mercury of right atrial pressure would be already a full heart. Now, literally, when that mean systemic pressure of 7 millimeters mercury shifts over to the right, this would indicate that there is more pressure within the right atrium. And then, my question to you is, clinically, would that then indicate more or less volume within the heart? Within the heart, that would then indicate more volume within the heart. It would not be hemorrhage or loss of blood. In fact, it would be just the opposite with an increase in volume. Oh, my question was, yes, moving to the right. Yes, moving from seven towards the right. Increase in mean systemic pressure. So when there's an increase in mean systemic pressure, there's an increase in volume. There we go. Okay. Now, that's one possibility. Now, clinical situation, 
I've given you IV overload. Now come back up here and primitively I'm giving you the right atrium. And there's the IVC. Okay, so remember, you want to put more blood in the heart. So my next clinical question is, would nitroglycerin move the venous I mean, systemic pressure? Would nitroglycerin and its effect on the veins, would it then me move the mean systemic pressure to the right towards 10 millimeters mercury? Or that mean systemic pressure, would it move it to the left towards, let's say, five? The question is, NTG stands for nitroglycerin. You should know what kind of effect NTG or nitroglycerin has on the veins. And then my question is, would that then, not just mine, but the boards would ask you, would it then move to the right or to the left? Okay, good. I apologize, there must have been some kind of communication gap between what I was asking and from what you were responding because now I can see that everyone's on the same page. So if I misspoke, I apologize. My question earlier was, what then happens to the volume of blood in the heart when you move from seven to 10 millimeters mercury and increase in mean systemic pressure? It increases your, it means that there's increase in volume in the heart. My next question was, the effect of nitroglycerin and everyone got it correct. Very good. So nitroglycerin is then going to work through psychic GMP, all that good stuff. You're going to then cause vasodilation of the veins. So you're going to have pooling of blood in the veins. So when you pool your blood in the veins, there's less blood in the heart. And that's why I was making that such a big deal. So therefore, nitroglycerin would then move the mean systemic pressure to the left. Okay, perfect. Okay, that's venodilation. Now take a look at this right here. Big, big C stands for compliance. The V stands for veins. So in other words, what would then cause the mean systemic pressure to shift to the right it is not nitroglycerin, but it would be some kind of, let's say, an alpha-1 agonist causing vasoconstriction of the veins, which means that now the compliance in the veins CV has decreased, therefore squeezing the blood from the veins into the heart, increasing the volume within the heart, thus increasing your mean systemic pressure. Notice there is not a single, single mention of arterioles in our discussion with changing of volume and shifting of the X-intercept. Oh, you're welcome, Noel. I'm, I'm glad that you are taking interest in your medical education, but sometimes there's so much that's going through my head that if I, miss, if I misspeak, please let me know so that we can all be back on the right page because one little thing can throw everyone off. So I believe everyone's back on the same page. My question again was, with this particular movement of the mean systemic pressure, what's mean systemic pressure? The X-intercept specifically. That's called MSP, mean systemic pressure. As we move to the right, it means an increase in mean systemic pressure, more volume of blood in the heart. The two clinical situations would include IV overload or any situation in which there's vasoconstriction of the veins. Notice I did not say arterioles. Notice I did not say arterioles. Because if we say arterioles, that would not move the mean systemic pressure as we, as, as we shall see moving forward. It'll be about changing the slope. All right, referring to TPR. So there hasn't been a single mention in our discussion so far about moving the mean systemic pressure dealing with the arterioles. The veins, yes. Now, ultimately, you understand the changes that are happening with mean systemic pressure? And then we're going to keep separate the changes that are happening with the arterioles and TPR with the slope. And then, obviously, in real life, we're going to put everything together. All right? In real life, we're going to put everything together. Next.
Now, obviously, to the left, we already mentioned nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is going to do what to the veins? It's going to vasodilate the veins. I need you to picture veins, not the arterioles. Keep that separate. When you vasodilate the veins, everyone correctly mentioned that you're going to have pooling of the blood, a decrease of volume of blood in the heart, therefore a left shift, and a, more importantly, it's called a decrease in mean systemic pressure. Number one. Or number two, God forbid, the patient has gotten into some kind of accident or some kind of laceration in which the patient is then losing blood, hypovolemia. So hypovolemia and venodilation, which means increased compliance in your veins, will shift mean systemic pressure to the left. I want you to notice something. Those three lines that I've created or that I've highlighted for you, there is no change in slope when you compare each vascular function curve to the other. They're all in parallel. I'm not giving you details that are frivolous. I am providing you details so that when you get such graphs, guaranteed multiple of them on your boards, you'll know how to then interpret them. They are in parallel. This then represents change in volume due to either veins or gain or loss of fluid. Now we can continue. Ultimately, remember, the veins absolutely do not have any elastic tissue, all right? Why would Marfans affect the veins? <laughs> that makes no sense. So, veins have no elastic tissue. Theoretically, again, this would not occur physiologically. Theoretically, as you continue increasing, increasing venous return and the cardiac output increases, you're sucking out all of the blood from the veins, and as you do so, theoretically, those veins would then collapse. So that plateau that you see at the very peak of your vascular function curve, as you're interpreting from right to left, would then flatten because what happened to the veins, theoretically, they have collapsed. That obviously would never occur in arterial structures. Theoretical point, just to make sure we're complete. Now, immediately, take a look at this graph here. You can see fundamentally, with these vascular function curves, there's absolutely no change in the x-intercept. What is that x-intercept then called in medical physiology? It is called the mean systemic pressure. So when we're not budging the mean systemic pressure, it means we are not changing anything or shifting anything in terms of volume. So what are we changing here on this graph of the vascular function curves? What we are altering is the slope of the vascular function curve. Notice, these are not in parallel. Normal, increase in slope as you move to the right, a decrease in slope as we then move uh, counterclockwise. And you're going to, once again, interpret all vascular function curves from right to left. And remember, as venous return increases, your cardiac output will increase until both will then intersect at approximately 2 millimeters mercury, where the amount of blood which is then being ejected is equivalent to the amount of blood that is returning to the heart. Now, with all that said, I don't want you to memorize this part again because this gets a little tricky. Do this for me. The first thing that I need to ask you is I need to know where you are with your understanding of exercise. Would you please tell me what can affect when you and I, when we go run, when we go bike or swim, whatever it may be, when we exercise, what can affect that it then has on your arterioles? Does it vasodilate your arterioles or does it vasoconstrict the arterioles when you and I exercise? We will begin there as a clinical example. Then we'll take a look at the graph because if I, we just dive in and start looking at the details, 
it's going to get very messy and I'm going to lose you. I can't afford to do that, especially online. Okay, so my question was, once again, when you exercise, what then does it do to your arterioles? Is it vasodilate or vasoconstrict? I want to begin there so that I know where you are in terms of your learning. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right. Topic, exercise. It's going to vasodilate. Not the veins. It's going to vasodilate the arterioles. Now, you and I, our cardiac output on average, at rest, at rest, you and I, at rest, 5 liters per minute. When we exercise, obviously, you're going to increase the demand of oxygen by the skeletal muscles. Good. So therefore, I better have more blood coming into the heart so that I can then perfuse more of that blood which contains oxygen to my starving skeletal muscle tissue. It better happen when we exercise. So in other words, my cardiac output could theoretically and physiologically double from 5 to 10 liters per minute. So what I'm telling you, and my point is this, I'm going to show you on this graph that when you and I exercise by vasodilating the arterioles, that we're going to increase the venous return to the heart. Before you even take a look at the graph, you're going to imagine to yourself on this y-axis the venous return. Next, you're going to imagine when we compare our venous return intercept, the y-intercept of our normal to that when we exercise, it better be increased. And when you vasodilate the arterioles, you know for a fact that it's going to decrease TPR or another method or describing it is called SVR, systemic vascular resistance. Same darn thing. It's all being determined by the arterioles, not the veins. In the previous discussion, it was all about the veins, wasn't it? It was all about the veins, man. <laughs> so... The veins, when, they, when you gave nitroglycerin, underwent venodilation. So there'd be decreased blood in the heart. Duh! Which is exactly what you want to do when a patient has stable angina. Ma'am, sir, an elderly patient, when you're having chest pain, when you go walk your doggy, place your nitroglycerin sublingually so that I can have venodilation and decrease the amount of venous return to the heart. That discussion is over and done with. So in this case, let's take a look at what happens when we vasodilate arterioles. Those two red dots, you notice, we're going from normal venous return on the y-axis. You only focus on venous return. There's no cardiac output curve here. Let it go. It's okay. It's not going to hurt you. Let it go. You're going to move from point A towards point B. We've increased the venous return. So far, so good. That's exercise. Next, an exercise, as you told me correctly, you have your vasodilator metabolites. Dr. Raj, don't you increase your sympathetic activity on the body when you exercise and have a little bit of increase in cardiac? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get all that. There's increase in sympathetic. But for Pete's sakes, why would you want to vasoconstrict the arterioles when you exercise? So thank goodness we have autoregulation. Thank goodness we have vasodilator metabolites, including adenosine, carbon dioxide, lactic acid, carbon, and uh, potassium. What are they again? Adenosine being the big one, right? So break down ATP. Oh, goodness, there's adenosine. It's not magic. And then the more that you go through aerobic, uh, aerobic glycolysis. Oh, good, I have lactic acid. Oh, look, I have more muscle activity. I'm going to release more potassium. Oh, gosh, yes. And we exercise more. I'm going to go through more of your TCA cycle and such. I'm going to release more carbon dioxide. Oh, my goodness. That's where all that is coming from. All that stuff is then contributing to vasodilation of your arterioles. It completely overcomes any alpha-1 activity that is being provided by your sympathetic nervous system. We can't have it. We just can't.
My body is amazing. Welcome to physiology. Right, Lexine? I know she's loving it. You are a lady, right? It's just, if you're not, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So the point being is, when you exercise, you have vasodilation, you're going to have decrease in SVR, and the only way that you can increase your venous return is by increasing the slope. All that explanation, just to get to that point. But you'll never miss a question now. You'll never miss a question. I clearly have given you that point B here is a factual, physiologic event that takes place in you and I Every time, maybe right now, maybe you're pacing back and forth because you're just so pumped up. Okay, arterial vasodilation, decrease SVR, increase in slope, increase venous return. Venodilation, nitroglycerin, pooling of blood in the veins, decrease venous return. That's going to be shifting in the mean systemic pressure to left. Notice on this graph, no change in mean systemic pressure. The only thing that we have changed is slope. When you change slope, it has nothing to do with volume. It has everything to do with TPR. Let's do the opposite. Opposite of what? Well, the opposite of uh, exercise. This time we're going to say <clears throat> there was a uh, myocardial infarction or hemorrhage. And uh, cardiac output equals, oh, excuse me, I don't want that one. Well, we can begin there. Cardiac output equals mean arterial pressure over TPR or SVR. And we're going to solve for mean arterial pressure. So we get mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times TPR. All right? So you've seen that equation before for mean arterial pressure. <laughs> Thank you, Omar. <laughs> I'm glad you have a sense of humor, my friend. Or otherwise, could you imagine these days? Whew. It's intense as is, but every once in a while, you got to crack a smile. Otherwise, how can you live your life just being constipated? Right, Omar? That's just a constipated life is just not a very good life, in my opinion. I choose not to be eternally constipated. <laughs> Let's continue here. Oh, goodness, Omar. <clears throat> so now, let's say that your blood pressure dropped. Uh, due to hemorrhage. This is hemorrhage. And um, as, long, as soon as you have hemorrhage, and you have a drop, a drop in blood pressure, obviously in physio, we need to talk about baroreceptors. So there goes your blood. Bye-bye, blood. Oh, goodness. It fell on the floor. The blood fell on, fell on the floor. I miss you so much. Well, we'll have a nice little discussion of hemorrhage and pathology as well. But anyhow, so the blood is on the floor. I miss you so much. And uh, you have decreased blood in the carotid sinus. So literally, when the blood escapes from your body, obviously, you don't have volume. So therefore, your blood pressure drops. So reflexively, reflexively, Within seconds or even milliseconds, obviously, I want to increase sympathetic activity, right? Why would you want parasympathetic when you just lost the blood? That would not be good. So when you lose your blood, you lose your blood pressure, you better have a sympathetic output. So in the carotid sinus, which contains what? Baroreceptors, not carotid bodies. Carotid sinuses. Very sensitive. They're very sensitive. They are. They are. And they're very sensitive to changes in pressure in the carotid sinus, the baroreceptors are. It de now it senses decreased blood and volume within the carotid sinus because the blood is on the floor. I miss you so much. So therefore, it is then going to decrease, affer decrease, decrease afferent signaling from the carotid sinus, pay attention, through the glossopharyngeal to the medulla of the brain so I can increase the outflow of Sympathetic, decrease the parasympathetic, and that sympathetic is then trying to work on the arterioles through the alpha-1 GQ system so that I could have vasoconstriction 
so that it's trying to do what to the TPR? Increase. Right? Increase. But the problem is, when you increase your TPR, you've increased your afterload, right? And you're trying to really increase the TPR so that you can bring the blood pressure up, back up towards normal. But the problem is, you may be losing so much blood that the blood pressure will not ever come back towards normal, but it's trying to move it up back towards normal, okay? So we'll talk more about that. But the point being is, when you have vasoconstriction and you have an increase in TPR, that slope is going to decrease. And remember, the primary focus at this point, when you have decrease in blood pressure, is to raise the blood pressure. So you may then have a decrease in venous return. Increase in SVR. A decrease in slope. You've understood that? And then you've understood everything that you need to know for the vascular function curve. Now, obviously, we need to integrate all of them. Because let me ask you something. When you have hemorrhage, when you have hemorrhage, there goes the blood. Bye-bye. It's on the floor. What happens to mean systemic pressure? Is it going to shift over to the right? Or is it going to shift over to the left? When you literally lose your blood and decrease your volume. It's going to shift over to the left, isn't it? In real life. So that's going to happen when you have hemorrhage. Exactly. Very good, Sam. Next. When you have hemorrhage, not only are you going to have a left shift, but because of the carotid sinus sensing decreased pressure, you're going to increase sympathetic vasoconstriction, and the slope is also going to decrease, isn't it? So now you know how to integrate. Now you pick up your first aid. Now you pick up your BRS. You pick up any physio book. And you see the mixed cardiac function curves. And if you find a combination of your mean systemic pressure shifting over to left, stop there for a second. No discussion about TPR. It must be a decrease in volume. Hmm. What caused that decrease in volume? How is the patient losing volume? Oh, something must have caused maybe hemorrhage. Maybe there was increased diuresis, whatever it may have been. Sweating, right? Excessive dehydration, so forth. So volume to the left. Next, if you find that the slope has decreased, it means that the TPR increased, which means that the arterioles underwent vasoconstriction. That's what happens in hemorrhage. And the opposite will be true when we exercise, which we will talk about in, well, great, de great depth. I will tell you this, after the uh, discussion of your vascular function curve, the cardiac output curves, much simpler, but it's just when they put everything together, that might just get a little messy. But don't panic, please. You panic, you're going to not only get your questions wrong, but more importantly, you're going to lose a patient, right? So maintain composure at all times. Let's continue. <clears throat> There are the three changes that we discussed. I don't want to go through it again. Number one, increase in cardiac output. More blood leaving the heart, then the pressure within the right atrium is going to decrease, shifting over to the left, number two. Number three, as more blood is leaving from the heart, then it can accommodate for more blood to return to the heart. Therefore, venous return is going to increase. The cardiac output curve and the vascular function curve are then going to meet at the steady state intercept at approximately two millimeters marker or zero. Please do not forget that the x-intercept of the vascular function curve is referred to as being your MS, which stands for mean systemic, and then P for pressure. And we've talked about things like the slope and so forth. You change it, you see a change in slope, you must be referring to TPR or SVR. If you're talking about x-intercept, you're talking about volume. Okay, 
things are going to get more interesting with actual clinical examples. Here we go. I lose track of time completely for Pete six. Oh, okay. We still have, yeah, we have about 10 minutes. Let's go. <clears throat> that what I've given you there at A is normal. Okay, and uh, I want you to have concepts in your head because the questions that you'll get on your boards will be graphs that kind of looks like this, and it'll be all over the place. So if you're not organized with your thoughts, you're really are going to be feel overwhelmed. I don't want that for you. All right, now, the first thing that you're going to do is take a look at the cardiac function curve here, and you'll notice the cardiac function curve has moved clockwise. So in other words, we have a negative onotropic event. Now, let's go through the three changes normally, and then let's put that into pathology so that you can get your questions right. Number one, cardiac output increases. Number two, right atrial pressure decreases. Number three, venous return increases normally, meeting at a steady state intercept of approximately zero to two. That's normal. Next, if your patient has a negative onotropic event, such as a myocardial infarction, now you have a systolic dysfunction. Well, what's going to happen? Obviously, the cardiac output is going to decrease. Number one, cardiac output is going to decrease. Number one. I want you to imagine now that the heart is enlarged, cardiomegaly, due to the fact that more preload is left behind in the heart, right? Why? Because cardiac output decreases. So there's more blood within the heart, okay? So if there's more blood within the heart, that means that the right atrial pressure is going to be increased compared to normal. Watch this. This is normal at zero, right? A was normal. When there's congestive heart failure, then you can see at point B that there was an increase in right atrial pressure when there was a negative inotropic event. Why did that happen? That happened because there was more blood left behind in the heart. Picture that. Number two. Number three. Oftentimes, on your boards, they will not give you the venous return parameter on the y-axis. They'll assume that you know that when you get a mixed cardiac function graph, that on the y-axis are two parameters. One is cardiac output for the cardiac function curve. Number two, the venous return for the vascular function curve. Do not forget that. Both will be there on the y-axis. Now, here's my point. The heart is dying, number one. Number two, increase in pressure, number two. Number three, if more blood is left in the heart, I want you to picture a patient. You ever heard of, and I'm sorry, I'm just being silly here, and luckily Omar has indicated to me that he appreciates my sense of humor to a certain extent. You've heard of the term cankles? Now, that is not a medical term, right? What does that mean to you clinically, though, if you see, quote-unquote, cankles? Basically, you're looking at pulmonary edema, aren't you? Peripheral pulmonary edema. What am I referring to? In other words, when the heart has died or dying, and on the right side of the heart, especially, it can no longer accept the type of blood that it did normally, it's going to back up, back up, back up, right? Remember, positive JVD and peripheral edema, pitting edema. All that is right-sided issues, isn't it? Right? My point being is that when the heart is dying, you can expect the venous return to then decrease. You can expect the venous return to decrease because the cardiac output decreased. That's change number three. Where is venous return on this graph? The y-axis. Watch this. Venous return, A, normal. Compare that to a patient with congestive heart failure. A decrease in venous return, the third change. There you have it. There you have it. So those are the three chains that you already knew took place clinically. All that you needed to do is take that patient 
and apply it to the graph. Easier said than done, but must be, must be achieved. Now, you're going to like this even further. So, so far, we have discussed at point B, a strict decrease in cardiac performance, not a single description thus far about anything about the vascular function curve. Now, watch this. <clears throat> in congestive heart failure, is it a chronic or an acute event? Well, congestive heart failure is a chronic event, isn't it? Myocardial infarction is an acute event. What am I trying to get at? There'll be two major compensatory mechanisms that will take place in you and I when we have cardiovascular injury. Number one, when there's an acute event, then the changes we can then expect on our graph or clinically will be that of the, of the uh, reflex type, primarily the baroreceptors. Reflex, baroreceptors. In congestive heart failure, the reflexes are no longer relevant. So what then has to come into play for compensation has to be, well, picture this, decreased cardiac output, Decrease perfusion through the afferent arterial of the kidney, correct? If we have baroreceptors in the carotid sinus, our equivalent of it in the kidney is the juxtaglomerular apparatus, right? Which contains beta receptors. So now the JGA is going to sense less perfusion going to the kidney. Once it senses that, what is it going to do hormonally? It's going to kickstart RAS, right? It's going to kickstart RAS. Is that an acute or chronic event? Obviously, that's a chronic event. That's what your focus is going to be here when dealing with congestive heart failure. We're not dealing with MI per se. It's a CHF. And hence, with all that aldosterone, you know that aldosterone then pretty much controls volume. So it will then reabsorb the sodium, and along with it, the fluid will come out. When you increase the amount of fluid within the body, and you put more fluid within the heart, it is going to do what to the mean systemic pressure? It's going to shift it all the way to the right. Oops, sorry about that. So therefore, when you get to point C, an increase in volume, and that's due to aldosterone, And that's going to then increase your mean systemic pressure. Next, you also concomitantly will have alpha-1 sympathetic nervous system. So number two, you're going to have an increase in SVR. Remember, systemic vascular resistance means arterial vasoconstriction which means that you're going to then decrease the slope. And worst case scenario, and at, at that point, you would call that compensatory. You see, call that compensatory because it's trying to bring the cardiac output back up towards normal. It's trying to bring the cardiac output back up towards normal due to aldosterone and vasoconstriction. But your main focus here is going to be aldosterone, so hence the increase in volume. The reduction, the CV stands for compliance, that obviously has decreased due to sympathetic activity also, which has kicked in. And then finally, we have D. 
So in D, we move all this. Decompensated heart failure. You'll have further increase in pressure of the right atrium. You have further increase in volume. And you'll have further decrease in compliance. So the more that you find the right atrial pressure to be increasing, 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 and at the same time you find that there's a shift of the mean systemic pressure all the way over to the right, as you see here. And you'll notice that the body's trying to do everything its power to cause vasoconstriction. Well, that at that point you will call it decompensation. And what may actually then happen in decompensation is they may then shift from a decrease in compliance to a, oh, excuse me, an, yeah, decrease in compliance in both of these. less of an effect on your systemic vascular resistance. Now, clinically, what you want to focus upon on chest x-ray with decompensation is you're going to focus on pulmonary edema. And then in pharmacology, you're going to focus upon metoprolol, will be absolutely contraindicated. The two major things that you'll be focusing upon in decompensated heart failure, once you've identified it, number one, pulmonary edema, chest x-ray. Number two, metoprolol, which can be then be given in compensatory heart failure, but not ever in decompensatory. Remember, metoprolol is a beta-1 blocker. CI stands for contraindication. Most of your questions will come in the sense of A, B, and C. D, with decompensation, you usually will then attach it to some type of clinical setting, let it be pomedema, or the fact that by giving metoprolol, the patient is further increasing right atrial pressure. That's the giveaway in terms of decompensation. Okay. That's as complicated as these will get with your mixed cardiac function curves. You want to spend some time with them and make sure that you uh, keep each curve separate and then start putting them, putting them together that you understand. Remember, the cardiac output curve is easy. Most of your questions will come in the form where it will drop. And any time you find that the cardiac output curve is increasing, obviously positive inotropy. I do need to go through exercise. I'll do that after our break. But... The other uh, major point with the vascular function curve, make sure you know the difference between, well, what's happening when you change the slope versus what happens when you shift the x-intercept to the mean systemic pressure. I think it